Good evening. The regular meeting of the Board of Trustees, Tuesday, April 11th. Um, I'd ask for a call to order, please. Mr. Kaling? Present. Dr. Spencer Robinson? Here. Mr. Quadro is expected. Um, Mayor Ciara is expected. Dr. Janelle Pearson Campbell? Here. Thank you. And we stand for a pledge of allegiance. The next item is our mission statement. Smith Vocational Agricultural High School which prepares students for social responsibility employment and post-secondary education for rigorous applied technical and academic programs. Is there any participation by the public this evening? Seeing none. Participation by the trustees. Yes, um, I want to share the printout of all the programs and services that the Collaborative for Educational Services provides to Northampton and our sending communities. Um, have it in front of you for both Hampshire County and Franklin County because um, we are located in Hampshire County and our, many of our sending communities are in <coughs> Franklin County as well. Um, so this was shared at our last collaborative board meeting and I thought you'd be interested in seeing how our employees and um, families benefit. So you can look on, on where it says Hampshire County Districts, you can go over to uh, Smith Oak where the um, third from the left there, and everywhere there's an X is a program that our Northampton um, families are served by. And if we wanted to look at our top sending communities like West Hampton or Hatfield, um, we could see those programs as well. Um, but I thought it was just impressive um, the way that they serve uh, communities in this region. And you know, the fact that the Franklin County districts belong to the collaborative as well. Um, I have one other item, and that is I wanted to let the board know that uh, Dr. Lincoln Hoker and I will be meeting tomorrow to prepare a progress report and his evaluation, and I'll be presenting it at our next meeting. Excellent. Thank you for that. Okay. Mr. Quadro, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> yes. Uh, the last Thursday attended the, <coughs> attended the FFA breakfast and award ceremony at the uh, Framingham Sheridan and uh, Smith vocational students won a number of awards and what I thought was one of the most impressive ones was uh, um, bear with me a second here Um, Bay State degrees, Smith vocational students had 17 out of the 30 FFA members statewide earned their state FFA degree. So over half of the, st the students that won this award or obtained this award, over half of them were Smith vocational students. I thought that was rather impressive. And then uh, on Friday, I had lunch with Lindsay Sabadosa, our representative, and brought her up to speed on what's going on with our uh, horticulture project. And she offered some thoughts, and um, which I've shared with the administration or with uh, Superintendent uh, Andy. And uh, we hope to uh, start moving forward on some of those suggestions, and partly due to the uh, our shortfall and our our construction budget and uh, that's it for now and I'll update us uh, furthermore on where we're at with the building project later on in the meeting. Very good, I appreciate it. Moving forward, we have a motion a second to approve the minutes of the March 21st, 23 and April 4th, 23 <coughs> Board of Trustees meeting. So moved. Any 
any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Uh, at this time, I'd like to turn over to Joe for FFA. Yeah, good evening. Uh, the FFA advisors couldn't make it tonight, but they did prepare a PowerPoint that I'll uh, efficiently go through. Oh, all right, perfect. Thank you. Uh, so this is just a group shot from the FFA convention. That's the hotel that Mr. Quadro referenced. Uh, and as he referenced, These are the names of the students who received those 17 out of 30 state degrees. And here you can see students being presented. We have Rosemary Barnhart on the left and uh, Katrina Chase on the right. Grace Clendenin on the left. Omri Siafu. UFO, excuse me, on the right. Chris Corbett, Gianna Daniels, left and right. Ben Fields, Charles Flort, Paige Krupa, Connor Lambert, Hannah Marcel, and Elizabeth Murdoch. Lily Ripley, who was also our um, non-traditional student of the year for Mass CTE, and Jared, Ru Jared Russo. And here they are together. We also had students, there we go, Gift of Blue, which is that they have uh, earned their own FFA jacket. Students who don't have them, we have uh, a number of jackets that they borrow, but these are students that have earned uh, their own jackets so that they can be embroidered with their names. And you can see these students uh, receiving them. On the bottom here we have Cody Hodges, Evan Sampson, Nolan Finney, and Joe Bonanno. <coughs> That's Joe Bonanno on the left and Michael Theriot on the right. Um, Michael's father is a, currently a custodian at our school, and on the Tuesday after break, he will start as the new carpentry instructor. Go oh. Bonanno again. A Lily Ripley. I, I won't read these slides because they have them hard, but. So she will be going to the national level. This is a picture of Giada. I don't believe they have a photo of Ben or Nelly. I actually met with, um, it was funny when I was getting ready to, I served as a judge for the AgriScience Fair, um, which I've done a number of times. Dr. Lincoln Oker has also done, and uh, Ms. Shardier. And, but she, before she went on to do her speaking, um, she was in the hall, she was really nervous, and. Uh, she ended up doing a great job. I'm pretty happy there. Yeah. Uh, in the science uh, leadership event, so in the science fair, third place, Katrina Chase, Serafina Gibson. Next, uh, quiz bowl, which is where they answer, it's kind of like Jeopardy, a number of different questions and things. So we finished in fourth in both divisions. They give them a topic and then they go. Wow, that was terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> and great preparation. I think you do it every day. I do. Terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. in horticulture or no they're just they're not, <coughs> I would floriculture floriculture is a concentration so you have um, greenhouse and floriculture and there is landscaping turf management it's not some of them are concentrations and some of them are topics within 
uh, like the trophy management part. She didn't, she didn't tell me what the demonstration was. I wish, I wish they had, but I can get that for you. That's the president of the Grange, I believe, the state Grange, <coughs> who was actually here at the board meeting. When they gave us the check. The Grange. Yeah, nice. I thought I recognized him. Yeah. Yeah. in October and there's seniors that are currently graduating? How's mm -hmm. that usually? So they go as post-grads. Yeah. Uh -huh. So they still, uh, it's still cost is covered by us and they'll go out to compete. And when that occurs, do they, are they generally able to show up or the, their life has changed and they have? I would say most of the time they show up. They're ready to go. It's something that uh, they're still, a lot of them are still involved in FFA either outside of here for age or they graduate if they go to college a lot of them are going to ag schools so they're still doing ffa at the, at the collegiate level right <clears throat> yeah. 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 as you can imagine equine is becoming a, a, a big focus again in our, at our school. Yeah, and in general, oh. yes. After the uh, after COVID-19 pandemic, a lot of people seem to return back to horse really? and equine studies and, and riding. So it's actually actually a Growing. up and coming. Okay. Yeah. How many horses do we have here? We currently have two. <clears throat> the whole when we're done with all the other. Um, renovations and things that are going to be happening over the next two years would be to build a new four or five stall barn and increase that. Um, that, that it's going to take more money and more planning and yeah. more time, but that's in, in the, in the five-year plan. Right. Courtesy Corps is an interesting one. So they uh, guard doors, watch doors, open doors, greet people, guests as they come in and out. Uh, so it's a way for students to um, really be extroverted and practice and, and those, soft those soft skills. Yeah. Yeah. This is our current leadership team, our officers. Uh, it's Katrina Chase, Allie Davino, Lily Ripley, Suzanne Van Giel, and Nellie Hankinson. <clears throat> And the rest is just some nice different shots for everybody. Does animal science have um, non-traditional students? Like, is either gender considered non-traditional in animal science? So I believe it's male-dominated at the national level, mm -hmm. uh, but in Massachusetts it's actually um, female-dominated. Yeah. And clearly here as well. Yeah, here too. Yeah. Yeah, I noticed that there are way more young ladies at this event than young men. Yes. Massachusetts and, is and including cute. the school and statewide. And there I am judging. I didn't realize they got it. <laughs> you want to hear credit? Yeah. I want to prove I was there. <laughs> like sneak up behind me and take photo. <laughs> Looks 
fancier than where it was last year. It's a very nice place. A very nice place. I enjoyed it. They still did their dance. <coughs> Highlight the uh, horticultural building project. Uh, we had our first meeting with our OPM, which is owner's project manager, to help us navigate the rest of the uh, the project. And the first step would be uh, getting out an RFQ, RFP, whatever you used to call it, request for qualification, request for proposal for. Of design services and um, we're going to get that uh, ball rolling and we're hoping um, we're hoping fingers crossed I'm being optimistic uh, seems to be the the uh, OPM is painting a different uh, timeline than what I hope we can accomplish and I hope we can accomplish groundbreaking of April 2024 but that's proof will be in the pudding in the process on how uh, quickly we move forward and, and get a design team on board and get contract documents out to bid and then under what format that project will move forward as there's two main formats which is uh, design bid build which is called Mass Chapter 149, and the other format is Chapter 149A, which is construction management at risk. Um, and there's pros and cons in both, and we're going to start having <coughs> those pros and cons out and decide which direction we'd like to move in. And from there, I'll turn it over to Mr. Smith for the update on on-campus projects. Yep, so our focus has been lately is to finish the renovation on the old rec building. So we plan on having the kids back in there as soon as break comes is done. Awesome. Um, and then in the meantime, during break, we'll take down the, um, the old pig barn and start renovating the MS classroom. Uh, take out the cabinets and get ready for the next, that next phase of the project. Um, also, we'll start, hopefully this summer, start the AC project in C building. Um, and we got money this year to start the control work on that. So, um, and the sidewalk project is still plodding along. Hopefully, we can finally get the finished plans on it this week or early next week. Um, they started working on the apple storage, uh, putting up a false wall to support the backside so they can take out that column and replace it. And so then start working on the floor structure. Um, I think that's it. I'd like to thank Mr. Smith for multitasking with different, I mean, if I turn a corner and it's a different project, Tim standing there. And uh, I want to thank you for your multitasking. Uh, you do it rather well. Thank you. Superintendent? Oh, no. Sorry. Uh, the negotiation subcommittee met on March 28th. That meeting, we re reviewed the pay scales for our non represented support employees. Uh, and these are even more complicated than I thought, with every position essentially having a different pay scale. Um, and these were inherited from previous administrations. We've heard Dr. Lincoln Hoker and Ms. Fairman refer to the additional steps that have been recently added to all pay scales for support employees. And I learned more about those. The cafeteria worker pay scales were the first to be looked at. And this was triggered by the increase to minimum wage in Massachusetts. Dr. Lincoln Hoker and Ms. Behrman wanted to ensure compliance with the new wage rate, and so they increased pay by adding steps. Those increases bumped cafeteria workers into the pay scale above them, so that was also raised by adding steps, and then the one above that, and so on, until all of the scales had steps added to them. 
the average step increase was a little over 3%. Um, and this is in addition to the cost of living adjustments that are also given every year, usually about 2%. Um, but it's important to remember that we were starting with wages that were below the minimum in our state. So our discussion then returned to the idea of increase, like increasing longevity benefits for non representative <coughs> support employees, not at the Unit D and Unit H rate, but somewhat above the current rate, which is rather low. We appreciate the service of our long-term employees and recognize that there are many advantages for the school that come from a stable workforce. Our recommendation, which this board will vote on later tonight, um, is to increase the benefits to $500 for five to nine years of service and $750 for 10 to 14 years, while keeping 15 to 19 years at 1,000, 20 to 24 years at 1,200, and over 25 years at 1,500 for fiscal year 24. You heard at our last meeting that Dr. Lincoln Hoker has included these increases in his budget proposal and the total uh, for the additional increase would be about $1,350. So thank you for being here this evening. Uh, going back to the traditional format, but very few slides. Uh, there's been a lot that's been going on over the last couple months, uh, especially since I've given a, a report like this. So tonight I just want to focus on a lot of just the recent uh, happenings here on campus. There we go, I think you can barely read that. Uh, so way back in February, we had our February uh, vacation. We came back, we had our monthly DESI CTE call. Again, this is put on by Liz Bennett, one of the uh, associate uh, commissioners. Uh, with the, the uh, Career Technical Education Office at, at DESE. And it seems like a, a lifetime ago, but we were also uh, in the midst of Unit H negotiations. We then had a snow day. Uh, I was part of a MAVA officers and, and DESE update call. We've been having a lot of those recently. Uh, sort of came to a, a climax uh, last week down at FFA, which I'll talk about that particular meeting uh, with the, the folks from DESE around the hoisting license. I can give the board an update around that. And uh, again, more unit H negotiations. And then uh, the beginning part of March, we had our uh, mindfulness session. We're wrapping up the mindfulness session. That was with Ted, who was a trainer at that point. Uh, and then we'll talk about the next phase that we've just entered over the last couple of weeks with Cindy Weeks Bradley. Uh, and again, that's all around our, our equity work uh, with the leadership team. Uh, as Dr. Spencer Robinson uh, mentioned, we had a negotiation subcommittee uh, meeting back on March 7th. We then had another snow day in the middle of March. And then on March 16th uh, was a full day down in Marlboro uh, where we had a MAVA officers meeting, we had a board of directors meeting, and then a general membership meeting. Uh, so it was a full day of, of collaboration and talking at the state level, what can we do to advocate for CTE across the state. Uh, so that was, again, another productive afternoon and evening. And then uh, several of us on the 17th, uh, we were able to uh, support and uh, stand for uh, the school at the St. Patrick's Day uh, breakfast at the city, the Hotel Northampton. And then Cindy Weeks Bradley, uh, part of the equity work and part of that contract, and she is providing me some professional coaching. Uh, so our first session was on March 20th. And it's basically 30 minutes to an hour. Uh, basically the topic is of my choosing. And, and just talking about my professional growth uh, as a superintendent. Uh, areas I want to improve on, areas I can try to open my eyes and see campus-wide, uh, just to make myself more of a, my eyes a servant leader, but just more open uh, to, to various things happening on campus and what can I do to, to better support all staff and students. Uh, March 21st, we had uh, obviously a property subcommittee meeting and a board of trustees meeting. <clears throat> and then on Wednesday the 22nd, we had the spring program advisory dinner and meetings that many of you were at. Uh, I think that was one of the, the best dinners that we've had. Uh, by far the biggest uh, turnout when it came to advisory members. I know if you talk to Chef Lacey, we were way over uh, the anticipated uh, plate count. Uh, so uh, he somehow worked a miracle. We found some extra food and we were able to make sure that all people at least were fed. And, uh, and then they moved on to the meetings. Leadership team, board of trustees that were in attendance were able to walk around and, and check in. And again, I was blown away uh, with the attendance in each of the advisories. It was great to see. Uh, some, some years we have maybe two or three advisory members in a particular shop. Uh, I can't think of a shop that had less than 
you know, six or seven on, on, the, on the, the small side. So a great turnout. Uh, we had a, the following day, busy day uh, in, in the evening for the custodians. They had to prepare for the program advisory, tear that down, and then set up for the following morning. We had the career fair in the gymnasium. And uh, proud to say that we, in essence, sold out the career fair. We had to turn people away, uh, which is a great sign. Uh, so I think the students had a great opportunity to interact with various employers. I think some, you know, talking about soft skills, just having those discussions with the adults. And I think that the employers uh, uh, also enjoyed themselves uh, interacting with the students. So I think it's a great experience. I want to thank Ms. here uh, for overseeing that and planning it, working with Tax Wider and, and guidance and, and getting that program up and running. And uh, it's only been increasing each year, and this was a, a highlight uh, for the spring. And then the mob officers, we had another update meeting with Desi uh, the following day. And then uh, Joe and I went to uh, the Delaney House a lot. You know, uh, for the monthly luncheon. Uh, that particular topic was Bob Baldwin, who is the new executive director for the MIA slash MSAA. They dropped an S in the name. And uh, Bob just gave all of us an update on what is happening at the state level when it comes to uh, athletics, some of the organizational changes that have occurred, and uh, some of the, the focus areas that uh, he's really been spearheading at the state level. Uh, so that was that particular topic. We had another negotiation subcommittee meeting on March 28th, and then uh, I had a meeting with Liz, uh, basically a one-on-one -on -one meeting on March 30th, uh, to talk about the hoisting license. Uh, this is what I was alluding to with the board, that we had an update, I couldn't really share anything. Um, so uh, that news came out on March 30th, and, and I'll unveil it when we get to, uh, towards the end of this particular slide. Uh, Seems to be a middle ground. I'm not sure we can really agree that it's middle ground, but there is at least a decision at the state level that schools can begin to take some action on, uh, at least in the interim. Then uh, March 31st through April 2nd, that was basically a week and a half ago, uh, several of us went down to Patriots Place for the annual Mass CPE conference. And I have a, a few pictures to share. Uh, it was a great night to, to showcase and, and celebrate the staff, uh, but also a lot of award winners that came from Smith. Uh, Holly goes in and that. On March 4th, we had our first official session with Cindy Weeks Bradley, meeting with the, the leadership team. I think we had very positive feedback with her energy, with her insight, uh, her ability to sort of read all of us as leaders, give us some feedback. Uh, I, I think that was a great first step. Uh, we unofficially met this morning. We didn't officially meet necessarily, but there was an assignment given to all of us that we're working on. Just to kind of give us a direction, sort of a project to focus on, uh, what can we do to, again, continue to expand this equity work uh, school-wide as individual leaders. Uh, so that's the next phase that we're in. Also on March, uh, I'm sorry, April 4th, the Health Technology Program, they had their annual CNA uh, celebration where they would invite in, in their family members. And this is typically for the juniors who have finished the CNA curriculum uh, before they sit for the exam. And we just celebrate all the hard work that they had you know, over the previous two and a half, three years uh, as the future CNAs of the world. Uh, so it's, it's a great opportunity to see the, the students celebrating their hard work. It's also really nice and touching to see the families uh, celebrating their, <coughs> the young ones uh, and their hard work. So uh, a special celebration. We then had uh, last week, a week ago tonight, we had the, the budget meeting that, uh, again, thank you to the board for approving the budget. That's one less worry to have uh, this evening. We then had um, the FFA State Convention, as Mr. Bianca mentioned. Uh, but before the actual convention, uh, several of us were down there uh, for the DESI update. And the agenda was to talk about the hoisting license and then to begin to talk about the horticulture concentrations. Same conversation that we had with animal science a few years ago. Uh, perhaps this is the time to begin to break out the horticulture concentrations into individual standalone programs. Uh, we didn't get that far because, uh, in essence, we spent a whole hour talking about the hoisting license. So, <clears throat> at this moment in time, the middle ground is the state will allow students who are 16 years or older to go through the process to earn his or her apprentice hoisting license. Uh, so not the official full-blown hoisting license, but there's an apprentice hoisting license. They will allow a 16-year-old to do that. Um, First question that was solved was a 16 year old may not have a driver's license, so how does that individual sit for the exam? They, they require uh, photo ID. So the state will allow a student ID to uh, 
fill in for the driver's license. So the 16 year old can sit for the exam. There's a cost for the exam. Uh, another stipulation is that a student has to pass a DOT physical. And uh, there's still some concerns around if you have to be 18 and not for that. Uh, it sounds like we're working through that process. But there's a cost for that DOT physical. There's a cost for the individual exam. Um, and um, I'm trying to think what else. Um, those are the major pieces. Now the state in their infinite wisdom, uh, they have granted permission for the schools to use their Perkins money to cover the cost for the <coughs> DOT physicals and for the exams. Uh, I have to ask the question or point out a concern I have <coughs> that our Perkins, and I've shared this with the board, our Perkins here at Smith is only approximately give or take $100,000 a year. And, and I've mentioned when I highlight the skills capital grants, you know, one CNC you know, machine in the, in the advanced manufacturing program is $250,000. Uh, so the $100,000 does not go very far especially when we're trying to support 15 shops, we're trying to support uh, teacher and administrative professional development, and so much more, okay? Uh, so then all of a sudden, if they say, well, but you can use Perkins for the covering of the, of the cost, DOT physical in the exam, we're taking money away from something else. And in my eyes, this is a mandate that's coming from this state. In order for our students to pass the, the competencies that are currently in the DESI approved program, so students have to have access to this equipment, it's according to the, the frameworks. They have to have this license. In order to get that license, we have to pay for the test and the exam. Uh, so it sounds to me it's a, an unmanned, un unfunded mandate, just another one down the pipeline. Uh, they acknowledge that, uh, but it is what it is. Uh, we also share concerns around uh, is this the right thing to do or not? Uh, I share concern that we have parents, I've had parents reaching out to me asking what they can do. Uh, I said what would happen if some of those parents reached out to local media uh, and this becomes a bigger issue. We are talking about hundreds of thousands if not millions of dollars taxpayer money that went to purchase a lot of new equipment for many schools and that equipment now is sitting still collecting dust. Uh, I'm sure people in, in, the, in the Commonwealth would not be very happy to hear that taxpayer money was spent on this equipment that we can't use now. Uh, and now the, the workaround is we have to spend more money in order for our students to gain access to it. The other question that we pushed back on was, again, back to the 16-year-old, when it comes to the curriculum and the teaching and learning, uh, why couldn't we align this to a grade level? Why couldn't you say sophomores or juniors? Okay, we, want, we didn't really want juniors, but hypothetically sophomores, but we know some sophomores are 15 years old. Some sophomores might be 17. But to sort of pick and choose, okay, uh, your sophomore year that you students can earn this exam, uh, pass this exam and, and earn access to the equipment, but you sophomores cannot. Uh, we felt, and I want to thank Ms. Wanzek who, who pointed out some of the, the civil rights concerns that we have, and, uh, and also around the special ed requirements, around modifying or accommodating for the test. Uh, their answer is for our students to go to a test site which also consists of adults who are out in industry sitting for that same exam. And talk about test anxiety for some of our students with an IEP, they now have to sit in, in a large room with adults who might be a little rough around the edges, putting it nicely, and telling that student they have to pass this test. Uh, how will that go over? And when that student does not pass the exam, that means that student no longer has access to that equipment. Is that an issue when it comes to an IEP as far as access to a curriculum? Uh, so a lot of questions were, were raised. Not, not a whole lot of answers were offered, and it took us an hour. So, uh, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but the state felt it was some good news to share. I think there's just some very valid, valid concerns and questions that are still out there. Can you name the shops where our students would be eligible for what horticulture would be? This would be for horticulture. Uh, horticulture, ag, neck, and animal science, probably here at Smith, would be the three shops that would have access to the <laughs> and do we fit in that category of schools that will have equipment that our students will not be able to operate because they won't have a hoisting license? We do right now. We do right now. The skills capital grants that we were able to get to help pay for some of the horticulture building. Uh, if you go down back right now, you see some beautiful new equipment our students can't touch right now. So only the adults can use it? Correct. Who and have a hoisting license. Right. 
And is your sense that there would be um, strong interest in students being able, this from the students and being able to earn their place in person? Yes. Yeah, there's a strong interest within the employers. And we made that known to Desi as well. We have employers who want to hire our students because our students have access to this equipment versus an adult who never had any hands-on operating experience who was able to sit for the test. And again, as a reminder, the test is similar to what we passed for a driver's permit. Your driver's permit test wasn't an op a safely operating test. It was, do you, do you know the regulations and the rules of the road? Uh, that's the same test for this. It's, do you know the regulations and the laws around hoisting equipment? It's not necessarily testing if you know how to properly and safely operate the <coughs> Uh, and that's what we teach our students. So, uh, so the state the awarded the capital skills grants, and now the state is same with Right. Yes. Two different agencies, but yes, technically the state is the state. Right. Yes. Okay. I don't want to steal Mr. Bianca's thunder, but uh, a program that he was able to, uh, as the leader of the building, bring in was Grit and Whip. He will share all of that uh, last Friday. The only thing that he was able to play in was all the wind. Uh, last mm -hmm. Overall, it was a great experience uh, watching the students do that. Uh, I mentioned, uh, again, I had another session yesterday with City Weeks Bradley, another coaching session. Again, a great time just talking to her and uh, kind of having me look at things just a little bit differently, which is great. Uh, this morning, I already mentioned how we sort of had some work you know, through Cindy. Uh, it wasn't a face-to-face -face or a sit-down and for individual uh, work that we began. And then obviously, as uh, Mr. Quadro already mentioned, we had our property subcommittee meeting earlier today. So difficult to see, but <coughs> some photos from the Mass ETE Awards. Uh, far left is me presenting one of the awards. And then the other three photos were the three special awards that we here at Smith were able to, recognize, to receive and be recognized for. Uh, sort of the joke at the conference was uh, they were going to change the name to the Smith Vocational Awards. Uh, there weren't that many statewide awards given that night, and we received three of them, uh, which is outstanding. So, as Mr. Biakis uh, already mentioned, Lily was the non-traditional student of the year, again, statewide. Uh, so that's the second picture in from the left. Uh, that's Lily. And then uh, the next one over, uh, it's all the staff, the teachers and administrators that, that were there. But there, we were recognizing Joe Brewer as the new teacher of the year. He's in the criminal justice program. And then lastly, on the far right, uh, I thought this was beyond special. Uh, we were able to recognize both the police and fire departments here in Northampton as the friends of CTE. Uh, and just all of their work and partnerships that they have. Uh, I, I sort of joked uh, when I was making some remarks, but it's also serious. The trust that they put into our automotive program <coughs> That our students maintain the cruisers. The same cruisers that might be chasing those same teenagers down sometime. Uh, so I talked about sort of that cycle. Uh, and then all the things that the fire department does uh, for us as well. And, uh, so very special night. I want to thank uh, Chief Casper, Assistant Fire Chief Helis, uh, Detective Victor Pudo, and I, I forget the gentleman that the, the mechanic. Sure. Sure. Jeff, uh, the mechanic for the fire department, who was also in attendance that evening. I think they were blown away. Um, and as I've been blown away uh, working within the vocational community, uh, they were blown away with sort of the, the tight-knit community that we have statewide when it comes to CTE, how uh, everybody's down to earth and student-centered. And yeah, that was their biggest takeaway. Uh, I just appreciate the fact that they were there uh, so we could honor them. So a great conference about a week and a half ago. <coughs> We're going to talk about the horticulture building uh, in a little while, talking about the official building committee that I would like to, to put forward uh, in front of the board. Mr. Require, you already mentioned the OPM was finalized. Uh, he was in attendance earlier tonight, which was great. So my recommendation for the official building committee, right now we have been meeting as a property subcommittee since the fire. And uh, you know, the property subcommittee is an official subcommittee of the full board. Uh, but now we're at a phase where now that we actually have the OPM on board and we have to go out to bid for the design architect, uh, most large-scale building projects, and if I see this, if you walk into a school and you look on a plaque inside the door, there's a building committee. And that building committee has more operational oversight of that whole process. So I would recommend that we sort of shift away from a property subcommittee and we authorize the makeup of an official building committee. 
who could meet as often as necessary, would have a lot of jurisdiction and a lot of um, authorization over some, just a lot of a lot of decisions that have to be made. Uh, I mentioned it earlier today. Any official contract decisions and votes, monetary votes, would still come from in front of the, the entire board. So we'd not be excusing that from the full board. But just a lot of the minutia that has to be discussed and answered, uh, I would prefer that we have that uh, in front of the, the official building committee. Doing some, some research on uh, what a building committee is typically comprised of and knowing who we are as an entity, I just threw up some ideas. And uh, I know talking to Mr. Requadro and talking to the property subcommittee earlier today, uh, we had some, some more ideas, but that at least one trustee uh, should sit on that. I would have my, my preference, obviously. Um, and, and Mr. Requadro, just with his background in construction, I think it makes a lot of sense. Uh, and if we had another trustee, I'd leave that to the board. I think myself as the superintendent, I think Ms. Fairman as the business administrator, Mr. Bianca as the uh, overseer of the, of the programs on campus as the principal, I think Ms. Chartier as the CTE director since this particular building is going to be servicing <coughs> one of the programs. I think one or both of our horticulture instructors who have been diligent, they've been coming to every single property subcommittee, I think they need to be at the table as well since they're the ones living in that particular building, I think they should be invited. The OPM should be on that. He, he already knows that. He's accepted that offer. And then I put out there industry experts with a big question mark. Uh, so this is very common in building committees that you may want to have somebody with a background in mechanicals. You may want to have somebody with a background in electrical, in plumbing, uh, and maybe there's some other trades where those individuals would not be going out to bid to get the subcontracts. They would not be working at the building. <coughs> Maybe as an advisory uh, on this particular committee, making sure that we're not forgetting anything or missing anything. Uh, so who those individuals are, I would leave up to the, the board. Some rec I know Mr. Quadro had some recommendations. Another recommendation that came up today is that perhaps we talk to some of those programs that we have on campus, and maybe they have advisory members who aren't necessarily interested in going for the job, but they already have ties to the, the school. They're already invested in the school. Uh, maybe they want to step up and sit on the building committee as well. So uh, I share that. I know it's a, a motion. There's a motion later in the, in the meeting. We can talk about it more. But I really do think it's a viable next step uh, to make things as efficient as possible uh, and make sure that we're not forgetting anything uh, as we get into the weeds. Uh, so there's that piece. Next up, as I already mentioned, we have to go out to bid as soon as possible for the design phase. Uh, that's that architecture firm who would be truly giving us those design documents so that we can begin to build. And uh, we keep talking about it, but how do we, you know, how do we and when do we finalize the official budget? You know, in the past, I've been showing the updated revenue sources that we have. We're just north of $6 million. The latest estimate that we had gotten from Dietz uh, when they were wrapping up the, project, the feasibility study was approximately 7.4 million, and how do we deal with that gap? You know, so those are discussions at the full board we're gonna to have to, to agree upon at some point. So those are the updates for the, the rebuild. <clears throat> and I wanna thank Ms. Wimet for this. Um, so I typically don't provide a whole lot of background uh, when, it, when a donation comes through, but I, I do wanna thank Ms. Wimet. Uh, I haven't had the opportunity to, to meet Ryan, but um, so Ryan Sanger uh, donated $3,000 to cosmetology. And you may say, okay, well, thank you. Let's move on. Uh, I just want to take a moment, and I'm going to try to read uh, a write-up that Ryan provided us to give you an idea of who he is and why this is important. Uh, so if you can sort of step back and just think about all the enrollment data I've shared with you over the, the past couple of months with the, po the population that we serve and uh, the high-need students and so on and so forth. And... Uh, Take that mindset, okay, of who we serve, and listen to who Ryan was and who Ryan is now. And he thanks this school, which is why he came back and, and donated $3,000 to the school. So this is from Ryan. This is not me. Uh, these are his words. So he graduated in 2013. So again, 10 years ago. <laughs> so how old are you now? So 10 years after high school. So again, put yourself in, your sho in, in his shoes. 10 years post high school, where were you in your life? He received his cosmetology license at 17 years old. I went directly to Boston and, and apprenticed at Mitchell John Salon under the co-creator of Living Proof, making $8 an hour, as minimum wage at the time, plus tips. We later moved salons and was a busy 
uh, commission stylist doing color, cutting, and styling, as well as being the director of education at the salon at 10 Newbury Street in Boston. He worked in Boston for three years. In 2016, I decided to move to LA. Not knowing anyone there, I rebuilt my clients in seven months and worked in Beverly Hills as a salon commission colorist. I worked at Beaumain Salon for two years and then Salon Kumuzi for two years. I was specializing in hair color and hair lingerie, hair extension services, making over $100,000 a year at that time. I then decided to open up my own studio salon, exclusively specializing in hair lingerie, luxury hair extensions, because the feeling of euphoria and confidence it gives clients was unmatched to any other beauty service I had performed. Hair lingerie extensions are also the highest payout per hour service and is the service I get the most enjoyment performing. I opened my studio salon in 2021 at 26 years old. Working behind the chair three or four days a week, I personally grossed $312,000 the first year open. And remember, I have zero, capital letters, zero student loans <laughs> because I, I was going to Smith Vocational Cosmetology. So you went from $8 an hour to $312,000 in a matter of a, a few years. So uh, <coughs> thank you to Ryan. Thank you to Ms. Wimap. Uh, and, and again, that's just another uh, example of what happens with our students who come here. They have a mission. They have a vision. They have a plan. They have a goal. And then they achieve it. So thank you to Ryan. Also a product of the Northampton Public Schools went to JFK. Uh, one of the Perfect. nicest people you will ever meet. Oh, you know just yeah. yeah, yeah, and my daughter was um, wanted to be his hair model at Skills oh, that's right. from she Massachusetts. Yeah. So I don't know if she, I think she might have got that. It was, yeah. And now we've learned what hair lingerie is, so. <laughs> yeah, right. Hair lingerie <laughs> is just the brand. That's the brand. Um, that's what we just found out. Oh, okay. <laughs> we just figured that one out. <laughs> you Google Yeah. That. No, they're just, as in anything, there's degree of quality. And so he is definitely dealing with high quality. And the, night, the other nice thing that he didn't mention is anytime he's in this area, he always comes in and talks to the students because he does, he does do some pretty famous people's hair. And he shares that with them, like, I was here. You can be where I am now if you want to be. He's super talented. That's great. <laughs> so looking ahead, like between now and, and the next board meeting, uh, I believe we have a city department head meeting uh, this week. Oh, yes. Oh, wow. Thanks for reminding me. You're welcome. <laughs> uh, um, that same day, so this is Thursday, Thursday evening, uh, as it's been on the agenda the past couple months, is the MABA Outstanding Student of the Year program. Uh, that will be in Worcester. And our very own Mandy Wright, who sits on the board, uh, she will be the student who uh, will be recognized that evening from Smith Vocational. Next week we have no school. That's our April vacation. So congratulations to the students and staff that have so much needed downtime. Mm -hmm. We come back from vacation on Monday the 24th. Um, I'll be joining the officers down at Acidet uh, where we're going to meet the new Secretary of Education, Tutwiler, uh, and just talk about vocational ed, uh, so to understand what his, his vision is and take a tour of Acidet. Uh, he was the former superintendent in Lynn, I believe it was. He is very knowledgeable of vocational ed, so it shouldn't be uh, anything too new to him. It would be nice to make that connection and get to know him a little bit more. The next day on a Tuesday, we'll have our continued work with Sydney Weeks Bradley around the equity work. On that Friday, the 28th, is Mass Skills USA down at Blackstone. I'll be down there uh, walking around seeing the students competing at the state level. Uh, I also have a model board directors meeting at that same meeting uh, during, during the day. On May 3rd, uh, the East Hampton Chamber of Commerce, uh, the new executive director reached out to me a few days ago. Uh, she and the mayor, uh, they're organizing this economic de development uh, all-day workshop and, and they asked about be there to just participate as the superintendent uh, so we'll see how that day goes um, I will report back on, on how that day goes Who so, invited you? the new executive director of the East Hampton Chamber of Commerce and uh, East Hampton Mayor do they know do they know that East Hampton students don't come to school? that's why I said yes as quickly as I could <laughs> well, so. you red line so you can't go to work there <laughs> exactly. and so. And they know that there are parents who would like their kids to be able to come here. I'm assuming employers have spoken. Okay. So. Oh, so this is a good sign? I think this is an excellent sign. Oh, wow. Okay. I don't think I'm walking into a hornet's nest. I okay. think I'm walking into a, wow. a positive discussion. That would be so exciting. So, we'll see. 
Uh, as a reminder to the board, you have your MAAC Day on the Hill event. Uh, I think at least some of you plan on attending that day. That Friday is then the monthly luncheon at the Delaney House for the Connecticut Valley Superintendent's Roundtable. We have another Sydney Weeks Bradley coaching. I have another coaching session with Cindy that following week. Uh, more equity work with Cindy. And then on that same day, uh, the NEAC Steering Committee has a several hour workshop set aside to, to continue to work on our prep work for next year's visit. On the 10th, I have a plan mob officers meeting. On that Friday is the prom, if you can believe we're already talking about prom season. That's Friday the 12th, that's at the log cabin. <clears throat> we received an email today from the senior class advisors, prom tickets were sold out. So uh, this happened to us last year, happened to us this year. So I think the combination of increased enrollment and uh, I think just a, a renewed interest in student activities and, and getting involved and having those experiences has led us to, to selling out the prom tickets, which is, I guess, a good problem to have. More equity work for Cindy, and then uh, obviously that same evening on the 16th will be the next board meeting. And with that said, uh, next May, I think the plan at that point would be just to begin to plan and, and sort of preview the end of the year. Before you know it, we'll be talking about graduation and everything else and wrapping up in June. So with that, I'll turn it back to the chair. Thank you. Um, Mandy couldn't be with us tonight, but she did prepare a report and it's in your packet. <clears throat> Uh, just to hit some key things in my report, uh, we have our enrollment admissions. We hit 320 applications uh, through this time, 18.75% from Northampton. All the applications, uh, except for maybe just a tiny handful that are, we're still uh, trying to get documents for, so that they're complete packets, uh, have been graded <clears throat> and ranked. Letters are going to get sent out uh, this Friday. They're going to get packaged up on Thursday, notifying students. Uh, so there'll be students that get the 150 for registration. The rest will be on wait list. They'll have till approximately, I think it's May 19th, uh, to solidify that seat. And then our, our uh, school counselors will work the phones, find out who, in fact, doesn't want to come, calculate how many seats are remaining, and then send out a second round with a deadline, and then we'll go from there. One of the things we're doing differently this year, though, um, in the past we've been releasing that as, through email, and we want to go back to giving the kids something in our hands. So our graphics department created uh, Smith Folk envelopes uh, for us to be able to put official letters in. Uh, and then they're also going to get a bumper sticker for the car that says SVHS 2027. Nice. Uh, awesome. To go in there with that stuff, just to try to kind of take that up a notch. I think it. We just feel going back to what is in your hands is a little more exciting and opening it up, so we're going to go back to that. Um, oh, excuse me, yes. Mr. Bianca. Um, you might have missed something. So this admissions, that'd be April 2023. Three, yeah, that's just right. a, 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 a typo. Typo. Um, and so we have 18.75% from Northampton. What about... A percentage from the other uh, sending communities. I understand there's what 64 sending communities. Is mm -hmm. that number correct? Yeah. Okay. So, um, is there a, another municipality uh, that sends? Uh, what are some of the percentages? Sure. From, sure. From, from uh, I don't have the exact percentages, but we're pretty. Um, we are pretty consistent. Uh, that Northampton and Hampshire Regional are usually neck and neck as our one and two sending uh, districts. Okay. So, and there's five towns in, in the Hampshire Regional School District. Uh, after that, we would move into Gateway, East Hampton, um, and then Amherst, and, and then we would start going into probably groups of uh, six to 12 students per, per area, all the way down to where they might just be sending one. Uh, but those are our predominant districts. Would be that, um, and including Central Berkshire, would be in that top, uh, that top group too. So, so it, it's Northampton, and you said the Hampshire Regional. Yep, district. Northampton, Hampshire Regional, and then we generally move down into Gateway, East Hampton, Amherst, Central Berkshire. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> but for the next meeting, I can let you know where we. Yeah, no, I was where just the, curious. Where the uh, this time around. Uh, as Dr. Lincoln Ogre stated, we did have the grit and wit. What that is, is that's a, a, 
it's an obstacle course in mental challenges, so the students go through different obstacles. They'll do a physical challenge followed by a, a, a puzzle challenge or a thinking challenge, either math or some other pattern. Uh, they have to go through this as teams, and then they move back on, and uh, they're timed. And students have the ability afterwards, to, after the first run or so, you can reshuffle into new teams. You can go through with your existing team. Um, so we did, we did run that. That would fit into our school improvement plan under school culture as we're trying to do team building and uh, other positive activities for was students it, that builds confidence. Was it the whole school? It was 10th and 12th grade students. So <clears throat> what we're trying to do is we're trying to create a, hopefully, what is a consistent recurring event that happens in each grade. So ninth grade we have the, um, obviously we have the student orientation and then we have our own student team building that we do uh, within that first week, second week of school with all ninth grade students. And then they also have uh, Gigi Wiles uh, who comes and he talks about bucket lists and setting your goals. It's really good for ninth grade. This would be one of those things in 10th grade. Um, currently we don't have <coughs> anything for 11th grade and then they would do this again in senior year so each student would run through it twice. They have a bunch of different activities so they're not going to necessarily see the same obstacles and, and puzzles uh, <coughs> you know, both years. So they, they do keep that map, and uh, they told me they'll do another. So it's the first year that we did that. That's a program that's out there. It's not something that you invented yourself. Yeah, it's a company, yes. Um, personnel update, just to let you know that uh, we did hire an adult ed coordinator, which is uh, an assistant for Lorena. Her name is Sarah DeMaria. Ag mechanics, uh, unfortunately, we did have to repost. Uh, it's definitely a tough, tough job. Uh, I think we're pulling a lot of people out of industry that are may or may not <coughs> be ready to teach. It might not actually be their calling, uh, but they want to give it a shot, and I commend them for that. But we did have to repost. Um, so we did post for an assistant principal, which was uh, approved in the in the budget. And health technology instructor Sharon Summers is retiring, uh, so we will be we posted to replace replace her. And for graduation prep, and we're starting to get there, little less prep, well, I shouldn't say less, different prep, um, uh, because we are going to be doing it on our football field now. So we did make the move to say that that's uh, going to be our preferred spot from now on. Um, so information for senior salutes, that's where we highlight each grad uh, and send that out on social media. The students, of, the seniors will be getting at the end of this week. Alicia Carter, I want to thank her. She's been the one that has been working on it behind the scenes. Um, each year and she's agreed to do it again and they'll start going out on May 1st after that information specifically around the final senior event week uh, that'll go out for the first week of May to families so pending your questions that's my report is it potential for unfavorable weather when the uh, weather at graduation we lucked out last year we did. I remember we got it in right before yeah the storm mm -hmm. correct? yeah so we plan on doing the same thing. <laughs> 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 right before the start. What's the graduation date? It is June first. Uh, we did purchase uh, two tents, so we have our own tents now, large tents uh, for guests and students. But we will have a rain date uh, the Friday. So okay. there is a, a scheduled rain date. It's just not on the calendar. Right. Yeah. Okay. So six one graduation. At and that's at six o'clock, I'm guessing. Six o'clock. Mm -hmm. Tim did the facilities report. We're all set there, Crystal. Yeah, we're pretty much set there. Um, the budget documents were sent to the finance director last week. Um, those are due by April fifteenth, according to the city charter. Um, as of April fourteenth, Friday at the end of the school. Um, day, municipal, our municipal accounting software will be shut down and they will be um, will advancing us into a new platform uh, which will be available to um, the city and our business staff on <coughs> This advancement is a very large advancement for us. Um, it's um, totally different than what we've been using, so hopefully all goes smooth and uh, we'll be ready for the 19th. The trustee scholarship um, we're selected with um, Mr. Fadro and Deb um, Carver. Those will be submitted to guidance. Um, it's the annual enrollment for health and dental for all employees. Um, that goes from April 5th through May 3rd. 
um, any changes or anything needs to be submitted by that date. Also, uh, the GIC has set up a new portal for all employees um, that participate. Um, the new board report, there needs to be a few tweaks, and I've been working with the vendor to set up another meeting um, so we can go through that just to uh, um, roll that back out. Also, um, I was notified last week that the FY24 city capital projects were awarded. Um, that's the Building C Energy Management System and the Culinary, excuse me, and Cafeteria Hood System Replacement. Um, the third and special ed invoices, third tuition and special ed invoices were mailed out on April 5th. Um, I'm happy to report that we are under $100,000 for previous um, tuition that's owed, and that's remarkable for us right now. So I think, I think um, with the uh, business support person, Heidi, she's been working diligently with um, reaching out to the districts to make sure that, the, uh, that they pay their invoices and if they have any questions or if they need additional copies. Um, other than that. Thank you. Well Under new business, we have a motion to second to approve payment of an FY22 invoice to Napa for $24.13 from Automotive Rebound. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. It's just funny to see $24. <clears throat> May I have a motion a second to approve recommendation from the negotiation subcommittee to adjust the longevity for all non-represented support employees to five years, $500, 10 to 14, 750, keeping 15 to 19 years at 1,000, 20 years at 1,200, over 25 years, 1,500 for the next fiscal year, FY24. So moved. And second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 We have a motion and second to approve the surplus for resale from advanced manufacturing a do all horizontal bandsaw model six nine one six S. So moved. Second. Thank you. Further discussion? Um looking at that sheet in regards to this, this piece of equipment could possibly garner a thousand plus dollars. What's that? Mm -hmm. I don't have that sheet with me. Um the backup sheet that goes with dispersing oh, oh, oh. surplus equipment. Is that realistic? Possibly, yeah, $1,000, that's the name of it. And something like this, a lot of these things we seem to get rid of are really not of much use to people, but this piece of equipment does seem like it's some use. Right, so with advanced manufacturing, it's sort of this double-edged sword uh, in that particular program. So as we are awarded skills capital grants for that particular program, we have <coughs> two issues, a space issue and an electrical support issue. Uh, so in essence, anytime we want to upgrade a piece of equipment in advanced manufacturing, we add something, we have to get rid of something. Uh, so this is the one piece that we felt uh, was the easiest to get rid of as we continue to improve. So. Uh, when Matt, who's the department head, as he's looking at the new equipment and looking at the cost, oftentimes we don't have enough money in the skills capital grant or the, the revenue source, but we can sort of fill in that gap by whatever he's selling. So, uh, mm -hmm. No, I'm not finding fault with this. I'm just saying that There's this is some real value, value to this piece of equipment. You can see something from that shop is typically value. Right. Yeah. And Tim has a resource in regards to some of this heavy duty equipment where he stays right on it to get the value. So right. I will say over the years that I've kind of followed that through and made sure we weren't giving the stuff away. Great. Um, next item, may I have a motion to second to approve to establish a building committee. So moved. Second. <coughs> Any further discussion? All I, I have a Go question um, for Dr. Lincoln Hooker or Mr. Quadro. Um, I appreciate it all of the your thinking that was going into who would be on the committee and wondering if you considered having a parent representative on the committee There's something to throw out there which is I, when i was looking at other building committees I, I, that is a common stakeholder so i would be open to that as well awesome. Thank you. 
further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, future business, May 16th, regular <coughs> board of trustees meeting at 5 o'clock here in the library. We already talked about this, April 13th, Outstanding Vocational Student Awards Banquet in Danix Hall in Worcester. At this time, the chair moves to go into executive session. To enter into executive session on the Massachusetts General Law, Open Meeting Law 30A, Section 21A, two, to conduct contract negotiations with non-union personnel, the special education director, and to reconvene an open session for possible action. And second. Second. Roll call vote. Mr. Kayleen. Present. Yes. Dr. Spencer Robinson. Yes. Mr. Quadro. Yes. Mayor Ciara. Yes. Dr. Pearson Campbell. Yes. We are live. 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 May I have a motion and a second to approve a contract for the special education director? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 I have a motion and a second to adjourn. All in favor? Aye. Aye. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.